Hey everybody, this is Brian Yellow and Origin Stories on Creativity number 10. I had the distinct pleasure to speak with Caroline Luer. She is a writer from New Zealand. Uh, her work can be found in the Champions Anthology, which is available on Amazon. All that information obviously is going to be in the show notes. Um, she's a moderator on the sub on Reddit. Uh, fantasy writers that's where I became aware of her and her story recently working for the man won the uh, what is this uh, June May I believe it was the April writing challenge it was a beautiful work um, that mirrored a modern society with refugees and and whatnot if you get an opportunity um, the link is in the show notes as well highly recommend giving it a shot she is a wonderful writer this was a wonderful conversation and i am certain that in every single conversation that i've had the word wonderful crops up over and over and over again because honestly um i i just definitely love talking to these these writers and these artists it it really makes me very happy to have started this project um and and this woman makes uh me feel no differently she's a publisher she's a writer she is a librarian she's done so much work with the english language it really makes me happy that i got to spend an hour with her and with no further ado here's carolyn lure How are you doing today, Caroline? I'm not too bad. Excellent. I'm happy to hear it. Um, so we are talking halfway across the planet. Almost literally, yes. <laughs> so how is uh, how's everything in New Zealand? It's not too bad. No volcanoes erupting, no earthquakes <laughs> today, so we're pretty good. Oh my, that's a, a scary situation. Were you affected by the, the earthquake that took out, what is it? No. Uh, no. No, there, we, we had, um, we've had earthquakes in the South Island recently. Uh, well, if you call it recently. Uh, but in Auckland, we have, uh, we live in a volcanic zone. Uh -huh. So that actually uh, softens that off a bit. We live, uh, New Zealand's on a fault line. So where we are, a lot of the stresses go elsewhere because of the volcanoes. Even though they're dormant, um, we don't get, we get the odd little shake and we sometimes feel earthquakes from elsewhere. But touch wood, where's some wood? Um, no, we haven't had one in, well, one that's done major damage in, in my living history anyway. We're, we're very lucky. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating, so the tourists go elsewhere. Oh no, we get lots of tourists. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and we even get them when we have, um, we had a volcanic eruption in the middle of the North Island and we got people coming wanting to see it, and that kind of thing, so. But earthquakes, but, yeah, it's very, um, uh, tourism is a big thing here, so your earthquakes are a big problem. Obviously, you know, not just because of the loss of life, but depending where they go. And, um, yeah. What are the tourists doing? Are they just checking out the nature, or are they doing the Lord of the Rings? Pretty much pretty much the, the natural environment. We have quite a range of natural environments. Even though we're a small country, we have, um, in the north, it's the, we have, oh, uh, an area where there's huge dunes, so there's sandy dunes, very long beaches up there. Uh, if you move south, you're looking at um, geothermal areas where there's mountains with snow on, that kind of thing. Beautiful natural national parks. Um, Rotorua around that area, the geothermal lakes, geysers, or that kind of thing. And well, that's amazing. Get, yeah, it's beautiful. And when you head further south, we've got uh, Fjordland, um, Marlborough, uh, mountains, uh, sounds, mountain ranges, <laughs> you name it, skiing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you very, you grew up in New Zealand. You. Yes, born and raised. Born and raised. Have you done a lot of exploring elsewhere, or is this pretty much your your home range? No. I've, I've been very lucky. I've traveled a lot. Um, I've traveled to the UK and Europe um, and to the US, um, mostly the UK and Europe where I have family. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, all, 
Okay. So Around what do you think? Places. Where's your what? favorite place in the world? <laughs> um, no, it'd be Auckland. Would Definitely. it? Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, amazing luck to be born in the place I love the most. Now it's there a beautiful city. Um, yeah. It's on an is it's on an isthmus, so it's surrounded by sea, and it's quite um, uh, hilly. It's not flat, so you get beautiful views of the sea wherever you go. It has very good weather. It's a large city, so there's lots to do, and yeah, I love it. How big is the city? Is it population wise? I think I think we're. We're not <laughs> well on on a world scale. We're not that big. We only have I think we've got four point seven million in the country, and I think we have I'm not sure exactly how many in Auckland. Last time I probably looked about one and a half million, maybe coming to two. It's a oh, big it's a huge city. Area. Oh, it's a huge yeah, city. It's, well, it's very spread. So it was it was made up of about four different sort of mini cities and then they amalgamated it but it actually covers a bigger area than london but the density obviously is not the same so there's nothing wrong with that no. <laughs> i'm in one of the most dense densely populated cities in, a, yeah. in the world and it's not yeah. fun <laughs> it's quite different isn't it yeah oh yeah you're living right on top of everything yep yep no you um we get a lot of people coming and saying where are the people <laughs> wherever they go <laughs> It's not like London or New that. York. Um, so you grew up in Auckland. You've been around the world. Yep. And you are a fiction writer by trade or just by passion? By passion. It's a hobby. It's a lovely hobby, and I hope to make it more of a hobby one day. But you know how that goes. So, you know, mm -hmm. I've done a lot of other What things. have... Uh, so I, I know you won this year, this uh, this last month's uh, fantasy I challenge. I did. I was very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, that was a really well written piece of fiction too. That was very nicely Thank done. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was. That, um, mm, I usually write quite comedic stuff, and I was having a bad week, and so <laughs> I, and I, <laughs> I wasn't feeling too happy. And I wondered. I was wondering if I could actually write anything that was actually serious, mm -hmm. and then sort of make people smile and laugh but one person actually did say they thought it was funny so, what <laughs> yeah they, they said oh that was hilarious and i'm like okay <laughs> interesting no but that's good because people take something different from everything so yeah. so no, i was really pleased because you don't know you write it and um you do your best and mm -hmm. you want to reach people and that's why you do it to be you know so a departure from what you normally write and how do you think that that yeah. stretched you as a writer? Well, it it well it it was actually getting the feedback because you can you can write things and until you have someone read them and give you some feedback or have some reaction to it, whether it's positive or negative or whatever, you don't you you know it's like writing on the air. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, and to have people say that they got from it what you put into it is is really that's what it's about mm -hmm. so uh, whether it stretched me i've written other things like that but i didn't know whether because they've not been read so much as my other stuff that's funny you don't quite know if you're doing the same thing so yeah something went right <laughs> no, i found so, it interesting I because i mean uh the nature of the story was um about refugees which is yeah. kind of unique in terms of a fantasy novel or fantasy well, story yeah and I, and I like to do that because I like I was reading another story the other day and it was um a friend's one and it was the the prose was really beautiful and it was really layered and in depth and I thought to myself I can't really do that and I started to try and think why and it's because when I write I like to write about people and I like to to write about relationships and it's what I like about fantasy is you can put a whole new layer of interest onto that um and but at the heart that's what they're about they're about people and i think too you you can make people see things more true if you put it in a different world and say look at this here's these people these they're stone trolls they're not humans but they're experiencing something that people experience today and it makes them really realize they get a bit worn out 
with um, reading the paper, watching the news, and they forget that these are people every day going through all these experiences. And sometimes you can sneak around <laughs> and say, hey, look, you know, it's actually happening. These are, you know, we're all just people. And that's how you reach people too when you're writing, is if you reflect what they're actually experiencing in their lives. Do you think that have you taken, um, I know the challenge was to put fantasy concepts on a work a day type of story. Yeah. Do you it think really you would have, it was really hard. It was not, it was not an easy concept to kind of work into really a fantasy hard. story. Do you think you could have done the same thing if you hadn't been challenged in that way? Um, possibly. I mean, it's hard to know, but I do like prompts and challenges and yeah, I do like, yeah, I like the harder they are, the more I feel like I want to make it work and make it because I love writing fantasy. So I want to mm -hmm. make it a fantasy story, you know. So, yeah. And for a while there, I really I wanted to do it because I was kind of in the, had the space and the time and and felt enthused to write a little short story. But I sat there and I had trouble and I couldn't think of a, a theme or an idea uh, or a yeah, start. Where did you get the stone was, trolls at? Did you just come oh, up with that, or is that trolls. something unoriginal? I mean, not unoriginal. I don't want to insult you, but it, did you come up with that off the back then, um, or? Yeah, no, that was. Uh, I think I I threw it into something I was writing, um, because I like playing video games, and sometimes I write a little bit of fan fiction, and if I've written a little bit of something that I like, I might, you know, make an original story out of it, and I was typing away with something in it and I just I didn't want to I didn't want to use the characters that were in the in the video game so I just chucked two things together and they I mean had this phrase stone trolls and then went <laughs> was so good I don't think I've ever heard of a stone troll before and the way that you're writing yeah. about them you know they were rubbing their fingers together and dust was falling off I was like oh my oh, god yeah. these are like unique that worked really creatures good, didn't it? <laughs> yeah I was like it has to be dust. Their they're, they're fists are made of stone and that you'd get dust. You know, it's logical. And that's the thing too I really like and I often encourage people to think about is logic. Because, mm -hmm. and I say this so many times if I'm looking at critiques and stuff, is if you persuade people of the the mundane logic in your story, they will accept the fantastical. And it's mm -hmm. like that. You can imagine someone who's got like stone-like hands who squeezing their fists and dust will come off. Yeah. You know? Total. I mean, so, <laughs> it was really, it was, it, it was the, it was the tiny embellishments like that, that mm -hmm. made your story stand out. That's right. And that's what does make, and I like imagery and I like immersion. And I think you can write about a pencil if you um, relate to people on that level. And if you make it real, you know, and that's the little things that make it real. So, but I'm also a very visual writer and a visual reader. So that helps me with that too. If I had to go in a different way, I don't know. I'm just, it works. So I'm lucky. So I know you have expressed difficulty with some stuff with your writing, Yeah. but then you, you, you kind of punch the story out. Can you that's go over kind of probably what you were some of the difficulties you've been experiencing working your way up to this you know i don't know i'd call it a really really good piece of fiction probably the best piece of fiction i've seen on that 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 subreddit oh, a very long so time sweet. i'm not even I'm in, not even trying to kiss thank your butt or anything i'm just saying it was probably <laughs> one of the best piece of fiction that i've seen on that subreddit a very long time thank you i shall now send you all my short stories that i have ever written <laughs> all, only the good ones though <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't, well, it's so hard to know. Exactly. I think you, don't, you don't know. You don't know if they're any good. But yeah. then I like writing short stories, and I think the way I write lends itself to short stories as well because you can leave out a hell of a lot in a short story, and you don't have to. Um, do you think you wrote a short story, or do you think you wrote the first chapter of a longer work? How do you look well, at that? Well, that's a sixty-four million dollar question, right? and yes. Yes, that's what I tend to do. Um, and often, if I'm writing, even if I'm planning to write a short story with a beginning, middle and end, I will often see where it will fit. And I tend to be writing, it often will come out like that as the ch first chapter of a longer story. And that's how I've started longer stories. Um, but I don't mind that. I feel like if, if a short story indicates the world 
um before and after that's fine with me and i like to read stories like that too so but yeah as far as difficulty really just finding a starting point because when i write i don't plan anything and i just sit down and i write it mm -hmm. and so it's got to have a good lead in and there has to be something that makes you want to start writing the story and with that one the idea of the working the working class or the working man or a working person that's a laborer um and trying to get in to that i mean and your one did that really well too and it's what i thought was really important in all the stories that they reflect that and it was hard it was very hard to just have that that level because it's such a human thing maybe yeah i i, mean, I definitely agree that you have to you can't forget about what makes the character real when you're writing they yeah. have to be flesh and bone they have to feel they have to be able to bleed yes yes definitely and and it was that moment man uh when they were rubbing the fingers and you know the parts of them were falling off it was like that made them real for me <laughs> yeah yeah and i, I thought... read the newspaper looking for a job i mean that's just that's really right. cool stuff so yeah. i mean i interrupted you and we were talking about some of the stuff that you're struggling with working your way up to this this piece of well, uh, fiction mm -hmm. yeah that was it was really the theme and trying to get an idea of a story that just even included the theme the working the working class person um because fantasy is usually outside of that and mm -hmm. we, t we tend to set it in a setting that's in the past mind you i like doing um urban fantasy as well so yeah is that what you primarily have have you written primarily urban fantasy up to this point uh no all sorts just whatever you know the need comes <laughs> uh -huh. and <laughs> like i say if there's a prompt um i'll just think about it i did um i did a, a sort of semi-western um fantasy <laughs> sort that's of interesting i've had the ink i had the itch to write a fantasy set in like uh you mean like the old west american style yeah, the or old west. Oh yeah. yeah, great fun. You want to yeah. do it. <laughs> I want to do it too. I listened to a podcast called Critical Hits. Are you right. familiar with it? No, they, no. They're doing a Pathfinder adventure right now and it's set in Texas. Oh, lovely. I love <laughs> Westerns. I love yeah. Westerns. Like the Brilliant. idea of magic in Westerns. I don't know, there's something yeah. there. Oh, you got to have a wizard on a horse, man. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> they, have a, they have a lizard on a horse. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm totally into it. I want to do something like that. Oh, and then, it's, uh, it's so much fun. You know, twisting it not, around and, and making it different. I have a um, my work in progress that is still sort of sitting there. Um, it's set sort of in an English sort of normal contemporary town. But I have a fr frost troll who's a bouncer to a nightclub. And it's that kind of thing that makes writing fantasy fun because you can have, you know, you can have death in your stories. <laughs> and I have another story where um, there's a dwarf and she has a sword. She's a warrior. She has a sword and it talks to her, but nobody else can hear it, you know. Uh -huh. And you can you can do all that sort of thing. And it's just it's so much fun. It's just. Hmm. I have a I have a world that I like to write in. It's completely that old school fantasy dwarves and yeah. elves and whatever. It's my throwaway. I'm just going to write an elf story world. And then I have the I have to have everything make sense. Everything has to be logical. Yeah. There can't just be a magic user on a horse with a staff saying it's tough. Abracadabra. Oh, it's tough. No, I, mean, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm too, I think I'm too lazy to do that. <laughs> Oh, uh, did you read the AMA from the uh, Immerse or Die guy yesterday? I, I saw some of it. I had a very, very busy day. and um, It was interesting it was... because he was kind of saying the exact same thing that you're saying in terms of there has to be a logical background to character actions. There has to be some physics mm -hmm. behind things because you just can't have... Um, the three examples that he used are when somebody's climbing a hill and they see the you know that the town stretched out in front of them mm -hmm. you know, how are you mm -hmm. climbing a hill and seeing a town stretched out in front of you yeah or I hear you. and i'm <laughs> yeah i am totally i get really mean um because my my most hated thing is when you read about your rogue or your hunter or whomever who's wearing a cloak in the forest hunting mm -hmm. 
and I'm like, have you ever tried to wear a cloak? In the it's forest? getting snagged on stuff. You're walking through brambles, just pulling oh it. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and in one situation, someone had a cloak with a hood and they were up a tree. How did and you climb the tree? <laughs> he was in the tree. <laughs> I'm thinking, have you ever climbed a tree? <laughs> oh, that drives me crazy. How about have the boots? Are they wearing their, their gigantic boar boots too? <laughs> oh, yeah. And, it's, and another thing I see, I've seen, to, to be fair, not recently, but I, there was a spate of... Um, <laughs> Do you hear my she, daughter? She's going to be on this podcast. Is she? Oh, <laughs> oh, lovely. What's your name? Oh, I shouldn't ask you her name. Um, no, I call her, uh, her name is Rosers. That's what I call her. <laughs> oh, oh, she's like, I can hear you. My, my dad was threatening to play the bagpipes, but fortunately oh. we have no bagpipes. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Another thing, the cloak up the tree, yeah, that got me. Rain. We get, you know, in Auckland, we get a bit of rain, and we can get some torrential rain, and I've been around places where there's a lot of heavy rain, and in some parts of the country, we get a lot of flooding, that kind of thing, and I read... Oh, I had this spate. I was reading all these stories where it started off and there'd been three days of rain and they were out walking, usually on the horse, too, going to a town and it'd been raining for days. And one was by a river. And I'm like, well, your poor horse would be having trouble for a start. Um, you wouldn't be on it. And the river would be flooding the path. <laughs> Which is all really great stuff for a conflict. You know what I mean? If you want to have conflict. Exactly. It would, that's a great, that was great ingredients for it, but I mean, you're not using it properly. And if you're not going to use it properly, exactly get rid of it. You don't need it. <laughs> exactly. And they went up to the town and the, the, the watch guards watching the town had torches. And I'm thinking, how are their torches still going? If it's pouring with rain and it has been for days, the poor buggies. I felt very sad for the people outside the town in the rain. And the poor horse in the mud, which probably up to his ankles or its knees or whatever, and mm -hmm. dead by then. You know, you just don't. And the snow and the weather. Think about it. And people, yeah. but then I suppose a lot of people maybe live in cities and they don't experience trying to go anywhere in weather like that. I don't know what it is. I think it might be the problem of not thinking through every single possible mm -hmm. action. Where do you want to go with your moment? You know, what's your beginning yeah. and what's your end? <laughs> and and just skipping tough. a whole lot of shit. Yeah, and I'm harsh on people too because the beginning, you know, you, you got to let it go for a bit. And I've I've had other people say, I never even noticed that. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, it does, it's immersion. If you want people to believe your story and have trust and faith in you as an, as an author, you've got to think about those little things because you can – I mean, you're selling your story to them in a way and you want them to believe. And then when you bring in the elements that are unbelievable, like a talking dragon or a talking sword or magic, they're going to believe it if you show them that you understand that um, if you're in a rowboat, you're rowing, you're not paddling, you know, tiny little things. But then, like I say, perhaps it's a little easier for me because I do – um imagine things visually so i'm walking through the scene or whatever so i shouldn't be too mean people <laughs> no Just it's a, it's interesting too because tree. if you're going to write if you're going to write for a writing forum you have to expect feedback and if you're going to take the feedback and yeah. be you know hurt with it that's <laughs> just not doing yeah, the proper it's, thing oh, it's, it's tough though i see a lot of people, people just get upset yeah and it's it's there's a, a real um distance between us critiquing or giving feedback on something on basically what what is just words and not knowing the person not seeing them not knowing anything about who they are whereas this person has put their heart and soul into this piece of writing and they're very attached to it and you want people to be like that with their writing you want them to care about it or the person reading it is never going to care about it but critiquing and getting feedback is very hard because you feel like they're criticizing your your baby or your creation and it is very personal but from the other side of it it's not it's just it's detached and it's quite um impersonal and you're saying oh well you know this sentence isn't too great and a lot of what you see as a, a critic you don't see as a reader so you need to have readers and you need to have critics and the first thing you want to have is readers and yeah. they both give you value
on a writing on a writing subreddit that's really hard to find those people who want to read though everybody yes. wants to write yes and that's true and i i remember reading a quote from um jk rowling years ago and she said we need more readers and less writers somebody was saying um in terms of content the reading is falling down it's not something that people actually look for anymore in terms of entertainment the video no, and auditory and stuff like this i mean they want passive things where they don't really have to pay attention where it just kind of washes over them yes and it's a shame because when you read more classic literature um the type of writing is completely different and we can learn from it but then everything evolves and you can't really stop it yeah that's my problem with classic literature is it's not oh my god my son now <laughs> how, many, how many kids you got right <laughs> i've got two that's that's my mr honk he's jumping on the floor and throwing things down the stairs they both they've both made an entrance onto this podcast Unfortunately, it's just a timing thing. This it couldn't be it couldn't be helped. Usually, they're at daycare. Oh, don't you worry. <laughs> Can you hear them? <laughs> What's he doing? He's he was jumping. Now he's not doing it anymore. Ah, oh, it's nice. Hey, <laughs> they got to do what they got to do. Yeah, they got to do what they got to do. Um, it, it's not a big deal. Oh, what was I saying? No, now I'm completely distracted. Um, we were talking about classical literature. Oh yeah, classical literature. Just a, a world gone by, unfortunately. I mean, in terms of creative writing, you want to kind of work your way into describing the world that you're living in. You know what I mean? Mm. If I'm living in Victorian England, I will try to describe Victorian England, but mm. I'm living instead on the Hudson River, exactly. trying to describe exactly. the Hudson exactly. River. And you're a modern, you're a modern reader, and this is where. Um, some but I will add one thing, though. It is built on the back of Victorian writers, though. I could not be, you know, Brian Ayello writing exactly. about the Hudson River without Victorian writers. And, exactly right. It's, yeah. it's part of us in our history, and I think that's one thing with fantasy, too. There's that whole, mm -hmm. um, how fantastical do you make it? Because you're writing it in English, and or your language, and you've got this in this fantasy world where they wouldn't be necessarily speaking that and it's 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 a con job in a way i, I sort yeah. of look at it like that because you no, have absolutely. to appeal to your modern if you're being traditional if you if we call say a medieval i think fantasy. that's brilliant i mean honestly that's a really good way to look at it too because if you are conning your reader yeah. they don't even realize they're being conned i mean nope. <laughs> if i'm no, trying to okay. trick you and you're and you're aware that you're being tricked that's kind of defeats the yep. purpose of it <laughs> Wait, well, isn't your horse drowning? No, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> Why is my horse not drowning? Um, and <laughs> you, you can never, it, it's, 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 oh, it's, it's a funny thing to say, but it's built, writing is built on lies because it, none of it's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. um, and if you get that sort of feeling, you'll not, you'll, you relax a bit about it and you start to realize you can leave things out and you can focus on some things and not others and you can play and you can create and you can build and that's what you're doing you're not reflecting real life um even if you're writing um contemporary literature some people may do that as a style but there is a, a very large a, a massive way of writing and and doing what you want to do and you can pick and choose but the things you have to do is be a bit conventional in your way you construct your stories and you have to consider a reader and think about who your your modern world is out there and they are the ones reading your story and um yeah that's about it oh, that was what the ama was just really fantastic i invited that um that author to be my podcast just so I oh, can pick his brain him? a little bit. I would love to have him. Unfortunately, he didn't respond to my request. <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, I, I would like to uh, reach out to people like that, with like yourself, yeah. with a more critical eye. It's one of the reasons that I was very interested in having you on this podcast is oh, some of the stuff you. that you said to me. It's very, very honest and visceral. You know what I mean? I know that you're not going to hold back, which is very important. And 
I think you have to tailor it for whoever you're looking at. I mean, I know your experience and um, you're writing a lot. You're serious about your writing, but you obviously enjoy it too. You have a passion yeah. for it um, and you're good at it. And you want to also improve and push yourself and, and get out of your comfort zone, which is also really important. And, and also so, the difference is I'm not like, I'm not like, I almost said something very crass, but I'm not in love. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you're wondering what, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm not in love with everything I wrote. I write, you know what I mean? I'm, no. dating, I'm writing it and then I'm moving yeah. on. And then yeah. I can go back to it and rewrite it, but I'm always exactly. writing something else. Exactly, me too. And I think you get past that. So I think you start off doing it for you. Well, there's different reasons too for why you write stuff. Um, and I think you maybe you start off wanting to do it for yourself and then you start off wanting to reach other people and you want that reaction. You want to create something that hasn't, well, for me, it's, I want to make people laugh or cry or feel something mm -hmm. and think about something, yeah. and have an experience and whether it's enjoyable or um, sad or whatever. I, I don't want them to say <laughs> what a terrible piece of writing. No, exactly. No, absolutely not. You don't want that. But you do want them to to have um, that emotional reaction to it. You want mm -hmm. to, you know, you do to know somebody so you laughed at your story and you made a joke. You go, yes, um, I did it. You know, and that's what you're trying to do. And yeah, they, it's you do get past that. It's like when you're writing a story and you get mm -hmm. very attached to the beginning, and then you suddenly think, oh, it's not very good, and you chop it up and you stick it in another file and you leave it. It's just words; they can all be changed. Yeah. And, and um, that's the best part about it is the rewriting aspect of it is going back and looking at it and doing the editing and changing and falling yeah. in love with it again. I had imagined that we're both, you know, of similar generations, you know, 80s kids growing up <laughs> with Dean R. Kuntz and, <laughs> yep. Yep. and these yep. guys wrote a lot of fiction. I mean, they never stopped. I've got Deeply Odd looking at me over there. What's that? Yep. Deeply Odd in a pile. Dean Koontz over there, Tad Williams. Yeah. Who am I looking at David Badalchi? What's her name? Claire. David. Daniel Silver. Greg Isles. <laughs> Lisa Gardner. We won't go there about books. We'll, we'll be here forever if we talk about books. Well, that's what we're here for—to talk about where we've come <laughs> from, the stories of creativity. Yeah. And these people and came out with so books all the time. They always wrote stories. When you walked into the bookstore and you picked up a new copy of their of their newest novel, I mean, they always wrote stories. Yeah. And Rice wrote 50, 50 novels from the 1970s yeah. all the way through the 90s. There was always a novel to yeah. pick up. Yeah, there, there's always there's always something. And I think there's been changes in um, – I, I've worked with books probably all my life except for my job I'm doing now. And just looking at what is coming through now, is just, it just feels slightly different. But then the, the self-publishing um, is a revolution, and I don't think anybody really saw that coming or has really even quite yet understood the value of it. it has yeah, I call, the, I call the Internet the Wild Wild West. I mean, we don't know what it is yet. Yep. No. And yeah, that's fun. But then it gives you um, chances like with doing critiquing and stuff like I have learned so much um, about how to little tricks and tips and how to be a better writer just by listening to other people critique or reading other people critique my work and doing it myself because it is so much easier to see someone else's structure or style or tone and to see where they're going wrong with it or whether it, where it can be changed a little bit than it is in your own work. But that helps because you can even compare it to yourself yeah. and go, yes, well, I'm doing that there. Um, you don't always know it when you're writing it. But, and you probably shouldn't. You don't, I think, want to be too focused on constructing a be technically beautiful story. You want to write the story first um, and then go back and make it readable. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I, I was... I wonder if it wasn't for the internet, would we both be writers? I wonder if we wouldn't no. just be content being readers. You know what I mean? Walking I in. I would still be reading. Right? I, I know for a fact. I can tell you for a fact. I would still be reading because when I was a kid, I can remember, um, you know, being good at writing little stories and stuff like that. But I didn't comprehend that 
those people who wrote the books that I loved with a passion were just like me. I, I thought they were, I, and I never, um, it was never a realization or, or it was, it was completely subconscious. But if I thought about it now, it would be like they were some separate species of people who did this thing. And who knew that they did it for a living, you know, or they, or part time or whatever. And it was something they made money from and that this thing happened because you didn't, it was years before I had co a concept of how publishing worked and how um, writers worked. And it took a long, long time. I mean, some, that's just me and my experience, but I never, I wrote lots of little funny little stories, but I never thought that I could publish anything or be a writer or gosh, create a story that um, someone like you would want to talk to me about on the internet. So, <laughs> well, you did oh. and you will, right? I mean, you, or, Why not? And this is the thing, you don't, I always thought these were some separate, love, amazing people <laughs> who had something that I never had, um, but they're not, well, they're different and there are some people who are very good at it and it doesn't stop. Writing and reading, I've always been passionate about people learning to read and learning to write and that's part of it at its very basics. Everybody can do it. Um, yeah, that's amazing. There's a guy I knew in the army who said, no, he quoted his brother who said if people wanted to hide things, they'd hide them in books. And that was just so depressing for me because it, it indicated that his brother thought that reading was a special skill. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. for me, it was just like, yeah, yes. Yeah. And I think, um, I don't have children, but it hit me when I was babysitting a friend um, and her little five-year-old was learning to read at school. And she sat on my lap and she read a book and she read through the little story. And I can't remember now what it was, but gosh, I can remember being touched by the fact that she could not do this before and now she could. And the world was open to her. And there are so many people who have problems in the world who who can't read and we treat it like it's just a normal thing that everybody can do um, and it's not and yeah. it gives massive power we do it all the day all day all the time and we don't realize the power it gives us in our in our lives every moment the, yeah. the, the forms we fill in the, the things with the signs we have to read um it is at its basic you know it's it's living life and some people don't have that who are you reading right now? Who am I reading right now? Oh, God. I knew you would ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not reading. Um, oh, that's not true. I'm reading, um, I'm probably reading people's stories. Um, what was I reading the other day? I'm not reading a lot. I, can't, I pick up things and put them down. Yeah, um, I'm the same way. I'm writing. Yeah, because I'm writing. It's, it's tricky. I'm waiting on, I'd like to be reading Scott Lynch's new book. <laughs> Why? But I understand that might be a little way away. Um, I started, I picked up Jim Butcher's um, uh, Spires, oh, the Windlass, but I put that down. I don't know. Why? I'm not <laughs> Why? It's, it's, I got it as a physical copy. It's huge, just like a brick. <laughs> That's the spoiled. difference, you know, right back in the day, pick up a big book, it was always very enjoyable, but now I download everything, so I don't know how big anything is I anymore. <laughs> and I feel terrible because a beautiful book is a beautiful book. Yeah. And, um, I miss the smell of them, honestly. Oh, yeah, but you, you know, you don't want books to smell. Apparently, the, um, that beautiful, lovely old book smell means they're actually breaking down and deteriorating. <laughs> All right, I didn't know that. There's the librarian and they... <laughs> yeah, it's a sign of... Um, if, if you want to protect your books, especially your older books, um, it means that they're getting probably getting damp um, and they shouldn't smell if they're, if they're in good condition. But that is a beautiful smell. Mind you, and a brand uh, new- Are you a librarian? Yes, qualified. Yep. Oh, no kidding. Professional. My, Professional. my mom was a librarian growing up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought about getting my uh, degree in library science and changed my mind. Yeah, no, it was, um, it's, it, I did a postgraduate diploma in um, library and information science, which um, was a, a year full of a lot of work in another city. And yeah, I'm glad I did it. I, I don't work in libraries anymore though. 
Libraries are extremely important. They were like my fantasy place as a kid. I'd go and just immerse myself in all the shelves of books. But I, I feel like with the internet, they're they're kind of going by the wayside. They're Would you changing. say so? Or? Um, yeah, they're changing and they're an institution that um, I think needs to change how that would happen. And I think we get very precious about some things we don't need to and we don't get precious about the things we do need to get precious about. Having, uh, it's controversial yeah. because a free access to books everyone likes to believe is their right but was never it was never always so um and books cost to be produced uh electronic books as well as hard print copies and we as writers and authors we don't make a lot of money from it it's a lot of work it's especially non-fiction books it's costs a lot to produce them and yeah, the the wonderful ideal of having every book being available to everybody for free is is fantastic. Yeah, and wouldn't we love it? <laughs> <laughs> That's what but, it is right now with you. It, you'd end up with a different level of quality, um, because peer review create helps create quality, and peer review is expensive. So. Yeah, it's interesting, libraries. Uh, we, we need them. We need people to be reading. We need people to be loving books and ex being using their imagination and have access to um, information and how to do things and how to do things differently and um, history and literature, but how they will do that in the future. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting subject. A yeah, I had an interesting experience. I went to um, go to our local library and um, to talk to them about downloading material because I wanted to be doing that more often and doing it from the library and using their services. And I, I got my card updated and I said, I wanted to be doing this downloading. They had the service. Was there anything special I needed? Oh, no, no, they didn't think so. Um, maybe I should have a chat to a reference librarian. So go upstairs trying to find the reference librarian for a start <laughs> and uh, managed to find them. And then they are with their little badge, ask me anything. So I'm like, okay. And um, I don't know, maybe I hit them before their lunch or whatever. Then they said, oh, well, um, uh, they didn't really have time to answer my question. Maybe I could come back in a couple of hours, make an appointment, which was very strange. And I said, no, I just want to know if there was any special I needed to know if I was going to be downloading this material. Oh, no, 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 I didn't think so. No, it was all fine. So, you know, I come home, go online. And the very first thing I do is have to download software. And I'm like, okay, so there is something very special I have to do. <laughs> I have to put <laughs> brand new software on my computer. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's why I went to the library to ask them that. So. I had the exact same experience when I first started getting into OverDrive back uh, like maybe five or six years ago. Yeah. I had no clue how yeah. to start using it. <laughs> Nobody really yeah. explained it. And, you know, I mean, from there, I, was like, yeah. I wanted to talk to you about where things are going to go because things are free right now. Nobody is getting paid. There are so many people writing and producing content, and we're yes, and we're undervaluing their content, uh, content, and this is part of undervaluing the content. Exactly, what a great term. Massively undervaluing it, and this is where um, traditional publishing works as a gatekeeper for that, because they used to right, or do you still think they, they do? They still do, and um, oh, there's changes there too. But I, I was reading or hearing recently that um, the sales of print books is going up, and ebooks is is rising less. And I can't remember what genre it was or what type, but there was one that was quite flat. And children's books still are. Um, yeah, I could see that. I, I have kids, so I mean, you buy the physical copies of the book so that they can read them and see the words. That's right. So the market's changing. Um, I think it will always continue to change, though, because of self-publishing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what you're saying is traditional publishing is actually winning because they oh. are the gatekeepers to quality. They... Gosh, I haven't been in, in it for a few years, so I don't know what's happening now. But there were big changes happening when I was working. And I think there's, wherever there's money to be made, <laughs> people are going 
going to be there. Whether they're winning, <laughs> who's winning, I don't know. I don't know. Because of this, if you're publishing a, um, a print book, it takes time. Yeah. So because it, because it takes so much time, um, you're going to get um, a review of the material. And if you're lucky and people know what they're doing, you're going to get, you, you, you're going to get good editing. You're going to get um, good consideration of what uh, co the cover and the design and the marketing and the publicity and all that sort of thing because it takes so long to print the thing anyway um, and to get the amount that you want uh, printed. But with self-publishing, when anybody can write up and produce an electronic book, with that being what they've, you know, what's also in the market, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's a big change. It's, it's a big, huge change. It's a real sea change. And whether they've quite grasped that or not, I, th I think they have. But in a way, too, we're talking go global companies where, um, you know, they're making money. They want to make money. Yeah, well, everybody wants to make money, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I want to make money. <laughs> right, so do I. Um, so, I mean, let's take, uh, let's take this on a personal bent. We've got each other right let's take each other as an example um i'm writing fiction i published my first novel online because eh, who cares i'm writing my second novel i've got three or four more in development how do i make money in the future how do you make money in the future you finish your work in progress you do what you're going to do how what's your plan of action oh making money oh gosh that is a big question because where do you how do you do it are you going to self-publish? Because if you're going to self-publish, you have to match them. You have to match the market, or but then there is a, also a perception of value. Which, what market, though? I mean, what do you have ESP, or I mean, because you're never going to know what the market's going to be on any no, given you day. Know. You have to go with your heart, right? You have to write what's in your soul. You do, but when you've produced what is in your soul, then you have to think. It's what um, oh, I was thinking about the other day. When you first write, you write for you. When you do your edits and revisions, you write for the reader. And when you finish and you market and you publish and you um, publicize, you are writing for the market. Um, That's a very good way to say it. Market. So that is what you've got to think about because so many people are not producing quality or they're doing it themselves. And that's it. It's, it's a quick way of saying it. But what I see a lot of people doing is they're supporting. They don't have any money. They love mm -hmm. writing. They're writing, Even people are writing very good quality stories. Um, they're leaving themselves down when they come to the marketing and publicity part, um, promotional, big pardon, promotional part of it that they know nothing about, which is totally understandable, but they can't afford to pay for something – that looks professional, fits into what the market expects or the, the readership expects or the genre expects. And so they're creating supporting material which doesn't match actually the professionalism or the um, the level of skill that their, that their work deserves. So in trying to persuade people, you need a really good cover. <laughs> yeah. And don't make it yourself on Photoshop. <laughs> Or if somebody tells you it's not very good or you want to change it or you want to upgrade it or whatever, it, it's it's about perception. It's saying, like we were saying before about the con job, um, it's saying look at the fantasy books out there that, pub that traditional publishers, are, trade publishers are producing. You want to fit into that mold a little bit. You want to connect with it and you want to say, here's my book. It's in this family. This because you're gonna you're gonna open it and you're gonna get something similar, um, because people like to recognize they like to recognize something as belonging to them or being expectant. You do get your few your few people on the fringe who like something really different and really um, fringe and a little bit out of the comfort zone, but you have to make it look like it fits. And part of that is thinking about your marketing and your promotional stuff. And it's, it's, it's tough. It's, it's hard work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, I mean, nobody's doing this because it's easy, right? I mean, oh. <laughs> and nobody's born with all the answers no. either. 
no it's and this is part of it. it is really hard if you're wanting to make money and i've noticed on the internet you know there's a lot of young people and you know i want to make reading i want to make writing i want to be a writer i want to make money from it. i want to be my job well hey go write copy for um an advertising company um if that's what you want to do <laughs> if you want to write novels <laughs> It's, it's a different story yeah <laughs> and they they don't like it when i say well a lot of it's just luck you know <laughs> well a lot of it's struggle and strife yeah and you just have to believe and there's a lot of that too you can't you must believe in what you're doing you must believe in yourself and that what you're doing has a point and you have to enjoy it it's you have to have a passion for it it's no good saying i want to be a writer i want to be a fantastic writer um well do you want to write a good story or do you want to be a writer do you want to entertain people um or do you want to be a writer in quote marks or something like that it's, uh, it's a different thing what do you want to be oh i want to make people laugh and cry <laughs> i'm the same I way i want to engage people honestly i love when i get yeah. comments i love when i get upvotes too i love when i win contests and oh. Oh, yeah, come on. Look, I, I was like, yes, I won. I wanted to win. I'm so shallow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's the best feeling ever. I mean, it yeah, really paycheck, a, a paycheck would be wonderful, but honestly, I'm just. Oh, if money came with it, yay, that'd be brilliant. But it, it validates you, which sounds weird, but you do, in the end, write for a reader. And mm -hmm. if somebody. And uh, um, have you read Jasper Ford? Jasper, I, I'm, the name sounds very familiar. Jasper Ford wrote, uh, well, he's still writing, and he wrote a series um, starting off with one called The Air Affair, which is about um, <laughs> being stuck in a book. His, he has some incredible ways of looking at writing and the interaction between the reader and the writer in his stories and I highly recommend them to everyone on the planet because especially writers because they make you realize that you're talking to somebody with your writing they won't necessarily take away from your writing what you thought they were going to take away but you were talking to them and, and I've seen this in other quotes too you go into someone else's head when you read their writing and it's like this um, telepathic communication if you write something someone reads your writing and visualizes a scene that you have created it's just words there's no picture there and they are sharing this vision you had and it's very powerful and it's empowering and it's if it's not entertaining wide or emotionally an emotional experience you shouldn't be doing it Mm -hmm. and, especially and in today's day and age where they could easily put the book down and find a million other things to occupy their minds yes and if you're if so you're engaging somebody for longer than 15 minutes you're doing something right yes more than ever because even me i'm not picking up and reading things i've got lots of books around me i want to read and poetry and and fiction and non-fiction yeah, me too i mean if i ever lose the internet i've i've, I've got hundreds of years worth of things i want to read <laughs> yeah. so we are in a stage of evolution and like with there's so many beautiful um creative podcasts um which are fictional that we just never had that well you had radio stories and radio plays and that kind of thing and they're very similar and they they hark back from that but there's different ways there's little um there's you know there's apps now there's mobile games and a lot of them are like um yeah uh, fall in london and um things like that that are very interactive and in different shapes so we're creating all sorts of different things and we've got um more visual media available to us than we ever had before with netflix and um is it amazon tv and things i'm not that much up with it but lots of different ways of of being entertained or experiencing the world or experience imagination yeah i mean we're we inundated it's just, it's incredible and we've got ourselves <laughs> that's yes, the best part and we just write little words on a page <laughs> and we're we're mirrors to it all i mean we're just trying to yeah 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 show and the world what we're experiencing kind of in a way 
It's really wonderful. Are you um are you going to participate in this month's challenge? Or is that too um, personal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just um racking my brains to think. It ah oh, well it I have this sword that talks, you see, and it's one of the um it's one of the prompts. So and I just like the idea of putting that with bureaucracy and I just I did get a vision of her having to hand over her sword and fill out various forms to go somewhere. <laughs> oh, that's no, awesome. Like, <laughs> so like, you've got something yeah. already in the works. Uh, no, I, I might not because I should be writing. I, I've got other things that need some attention uh, that have been a bit left behind. I, I write like three or four flash pieces a day. I'm trying to work two short fiction and I'm trying to work my work in project ghost at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I, <hear you. laughs> I tell myself it's finished and i'm like yeah it's not finished <laughs> <laughs> last last month i i did i kind of mailed in the end i wanted to keep writing it i had so much i had like an envision of this this yeah. underground city that i wanted to write and i just ran out of words oh i loved like, your story I did you really yes i did and I, I i i keep every now and then during the day i'm like oh i have to respond to those um those prompts on for that month because i like to do it I, I think it's nice if you do it after the voting um to give people feedback but no i loved your story it was brilliant i wanted there was like there were three stories i really wanted to vote for and i i, I couldn't no i well, really I, really liked honestly them. i had a hard time reading a lot of them um yeah. yours was really really good and after i read yours i just had a hard time sinking into anybody else's honestly Oh, look, I'm really terrible because I get bored really easily. And yeah, if, me uh, too. I'm like, nothing I, about any of the people's work. I mean, it was just, it was me. I was just writing way too much and just having a hard time reading. You do. It sort of hits you in the face. And I think that's why I'm not picking, picking up books like I used to, because I am supposed to be deep in these stories and, and moving them on and creating them and fixing the plot holes. And because and I don't, I'm not a planner. So I sit down and I write it. And so yeah, it's like, way. you're quite you're in it and it's you can't leave it it makes it you're thinking about little things about it all the time and you're reviewing and it's very intensive and your brain just doesn't really want and it's like listening to music um i can't listen to music with lyrics if i'm writing because i start to write the lyrics you know and, and, and this but instrumental music is really good because it just switches off part of your brain and it's like that i start to want to if I'm watching too much TV or a movie or something or a series, which is a very strong voice, I'll start writing in that voice, um, which can be a bit of a problem if you stop watching it. <laughs> I, I, I listen to only gaming music now. It's just supposedly, according yeah. to a post, it's supposed to help with the concentration because that's what gaming music is supposed yeah. to do. And yeah. it just sits in the background as low as possible. Yeah. It really works really very well to keep me focused. It does work <laughs> well. I like I you know I'm I'm good with quiet if there's quiet I'm used to having a lot of noise around from doing university studies and having people just do whatever they like around you like your three <laughs> small children <laughs> you just got to get on with it yeah so, exactly but yeah it does help you find this music well you know Caroline this was a, a really fantastic conversation and you were worried oh, that you wouldn't have interesting things to say and you oh. you are an interesting fantastic person <laughs> Thank you. I feel like a very boring person, but well, you're not. Absolutely, shouldn't say that about yourself because you have a lot of interesting things to say, mm -hmm. and hopefully, one day we're going to be able to duplicate this conversation and do this again. Um, and I will actually have something. Well, I mean, I have one story published, but maybe I actually have a novel or a novella, and I can. Well, say if you can give us a, a, an actual outline to how that happened, that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to mention anything before we go? Um, Oh, I, I'd like to plug the um, Fantasy Writers Anthology. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Let me make sure I have. I think I, I think plugged I, that link into. I think I sent you a link for it. Okay, then I plugged that link in. That's a Champions Anthology, yeah, right? It's beautiful. Um, and Alex Bradshaw put it together off his own bat, and I was absolutely stunned at what a wonderful job he did. Um, just because he wanted to really and we have ended up with this beautiful beautiful um electronic book which is free on a few platforms and i can um give you a link to the other places as well later if you oh, like oh please absolutely and also um you are a publishing professional right you've had past experience in that 
Well, I've worked in publishing, yeah, yeah. And also you are a librarian by trade. That, well, yeah, I was. <laughs> I do different things now, but yes, I've worked in um I've worked in books retail and books um in books publishing industry and in in libraries, um in reference, uh doing reference work. Uh, I I've worked for the National Library here, which does the school library service, and um I've worked in the university library. Yeah, lots of books. Uh, is there oh, any place on the internet that people can get um? information from you if they wanted to? Are you doing critiques anywhere? Um, yeah, I do critiques on um, fantasy writers and occasionally on our writing. People are welcome to On our ask. writing? Yeah, yeah. So both of those and are, can I indicate both of those on, on the notes as well? Those are both Reddit, yeah. right? You can put my um, okay. username on there, Artemis Queries. Yeah. I'm okay, there. excellent. I was wondering if you'd let me do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, anything? <laughs> What's that? They, they know who I am now. What? I can't remain shy and anonymous forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really awesome. I'm so happy that I got to talk to you and, <laughs> and put a voice. You don't sound like Tweety Bird at all. Oh, you're so sweet. I, I'm honestly very disappointed. I've got my, I've got my voice changer on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Caroline. I really, really enjoyed talking with you, and uh, I look forward to interacting with you on um, Reddit, and also hopefully in the future we can have another me conversation. Me too, mate. Yeah, thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. It's, it's been yeah, fun. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that was Caroline Luer. Uh, again, her information can be found in the show notes. Definitely do check out her story, Working for the Man, and the Champions Anthology. Not only is it her work, but there's a ton of writers also in there included. And, you know, if it wasn't for supporting indie writers, people who are struggling to, to not only find the voice, but to get their voices heard, um, we probably wouldn't have, you know, the champions of the English language like Shakespeare and Stephen King. But... Don't take my word for it. Take theirs. They're available on Amazon. The, uh, the the Champions Anthology is available for purchase. The information, again, is in the show notes. And uh, next week, I do have another show for you, or whenever it's going to be available. Up in the air, I have E. Rachel Hardcastle, author of a wonderful series of books, who also reaches out to children to help them uh, write themselves. Uh, it was a great conversation. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.